Mario Bonds is a singer, songwriter, and author, and a compelling motivational speaker. His personal story includes going blind at age 10, abuse, abandonment, poverty, homelessness, and many other curveballs. How he found the drive to motivate himself, to persevere, make the right choices, will inspire you. A cast member from the 2012 run of the Oxygen Network's The Glee Project, Mario's experiences and lessons have motivated many audiences to push the envelope, overcome setbacks, and make good choices so they too can reach their goals on their own road to success. Please join in welcoming, welcoming, welcoming to our stage Mario Bonds. And it's an honor for me to have this opportunity to speak before you this afternoon at the 60th Annual Ward Luncheon. In front of an agency that has offered goodwill to the utmost with 26.4 million people served since its national inception. I find your mission and your impact inspiring. For years, goodwill has given job seekers from all walks of life another chance. You provide educational and employment and the much needed support for programs for youth, seniors, veterans, people with criminal backgrounds and more. But I am especially inspired by what you do in your initiatives for people with disabilities. We live in a country where people with disabilities specifically find it hard to score and retain employment. But you are there to spearhead the conversation and act as a bridge between being prepared, opportunity, and ultimately success. And for that, I say thank you. Please join me in applauding your work because you deserve it. I'm especially encouraged that you've devoted part of this luncheon to recognizing the importance of highlighting people with disabilities and for being an agency that further highlights our abilities in putting us to work. I am a proud product of what it lo really looks like for people to believe in you. And when you think about it, each of us has a disability. For some of us, it's very apparent others not so much. I believe that we each are given a box of life's chocolates and it's the luck of the draw of what's inside. But what we do with the box's content is influenced by many factors. My goal today is to have you view this box, my personal box of chocolates personally, up close through the eyes of a blind black man that has overcome obstacles with a capital O. Now you doubtless have heard the research and probably know far too well the statistics, the disturbing statistics that exist for people with disabilities. And by inviting me to speak before you today, you give me the opportunity to give the facts a face, again, the face of a blind black man. And to begin with, there is absolutely nothing more destructive than diminished expectations. Diminished expectations extinguish the flame of our soul. And each of us here knows what that feels like. Imagine a chorus of naysayers telling you that you will never be anything. You won't make it. You're blind. You're black. I'd like to share a few of my experiences and how I have become a conqueror and a person who is revered an overcomer of many obstacles. Long before I was chosen to appear on television back in 2012, I had more drama in my life than I knew what to do with. I come from a large family of nine siblings. My mother and father had two sets of twins, two single-born children, and a set of triplets and I'm a part of the triplets. I'm the better looking half though. <laughs> Our mom died suddenly when we were five months old. That's the triplets being the youngest. And my father wasn't interested in doing the father thing, so he abandoned us and ended up giving us to his mother, my grandmother, 
which ended up being a good thing since he turned to a life of drugs and crime and ended up in and out of jail. Now, my paternal grandmother took it upon herself to raise all nine of us after have raised her own six kids. Now, as for me, I was born with a rare eye disease called morning glory syndrome. It has a beautiful name, morning glory syndrome. Uh, the MOOC that discovered the, uh, the disease said that, that when the disease is done ravaging the eye, the optic nerve looks like the morning glory flower. So I'm still searching for a garden of morning glory flowers so I can go rip them all up. <laughs> so I started off life with vision in both eyes. At age five, I had a surgery that was supposed to save the vision in my right eye, but I ended up losing the vision in that eye. And three years later, at age eight, I lost the vision in my left eye. Now at age five, again, I could still see before that surgery. And before going totally blind at age eight, I had been used to riding bikes, playing video games, watching TV and doing all the other things that require having sight. You see, kids in the ghetto have enough of a chance when it comes trying to get through from day to day. So you can imagine what I was subjected to and how hard my life was living in the ghetto. Now, though my grandmother did the best she could, the needs of so many kids was obviously too much to, for her. And adding to our problem was the fact that other family members and their kids would come to live with us for months on end. And at one point, there were 20 people living in a two-bedroom apartment. And I witnessed disturbing fistfights and abuse. Now, actually, one of my last visual memories was seeing my father being arrested and taken to jail for the last time. And I was almost sorry that my vision hadn't gone yet because that memory became seared in my mind. So as a result of our constant challenges, including frequent evictions, we were always moving. Growing up, we moved back and forth between Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. I moved 15 times between these three states. I attended 13 different public schools, and I wasn't even a military brat. No envy there. So despite what was going on around me, I had to contend with the fact that I was going blind. Morning glory syndrome is a disease that no matter what doctors do, the subject is going to go blind. It's a disease that destroys the optic nerve. And if you're familiar with how the eye works, the optic nerve passes images to the brain. Mine is destroyed. And since everyone knew that going totally blind was inevitable for Mario, they wanted me to learn how to read Braille and learn how to use a white cane. I still had a little bit of vision at the time. So when they presented me with my first cane, I threw it back at the instructor. I was too stubborn for my own good, and I was so sure that they were trying to make me blind, and there was no way I was going to be one of those blind weirdos walking around with a white cane. And Braille, are you kidding me? I don't want to read with my fingers. So I was on the road to no, to no success, and Prince George's County had me labeled malfunctioned and a troublemaker. Interestingly, a move to Virginia changed my life. Here is where the expectations for me transitioned from the glass half empty to a glass half full. The Virginia school system specialist encouraged me, fought me, forced me to not use my blindness and my family's turbulent circumstances as an excuse to fail in life. And because of them, I ultimately fell in love with reading, technology, and music, and I discovered singing and piano playing. Finally, I felt like I belonged. I can also thank my grandmother for not, for not allowing me to be labeled and removed from public school. Prince George's County, and at some point Virginia, before I turned around, told my grandmother he needs to be segregated into a school for the blind. And my grandmother fought back and said, no, there's a good brain in there. Give him the tools he needs and teach him in place. 
So with my grandmother and the specialist collective encouragement, eventually, they help something inside me click. I was discovering the tasty caramels in my box of chocolate instead of those disgusting ones that we all bite and put back in the box and then look the other way. <laughs> I became determined to take advantage of my God-given talent and to master much in life. They helped me discover assistive technology, talking computers, and I learned to email, word process, and do everything that sighted people do using the computer just by using the keyboard. And despite the fact that my family was living in a motel, and yet again, there was more drama and abuse than I knew what to do with, with physical, emotional, and even sexual abuse joining my young resume. With a new focus, because of the specialist, I realized that education and the mastery of assistive technology would be the keys to success and my making a better life someday. I had lost my vision, but they helped me realize that deep down inside, that was not the end. So they taught me how to read Braille. I learned how to use a white cane. I learned how to use the computer to do what sighted people use the computer for and became so proficient that they had me teaching my peers at 12 years old without a paycheck. Yeah, we need to talk to Fairfax County, Virginia about retro pay. <laughs> In the eighth grade, my family moved back to Prince George's County and I was placed with the same teachers that called me malfunctioned. And so when they saw me coming, it was a uh-oh. But this time, Mario was alive with a thirst for knowledge, and they were surprised. So I had to fight Prince George's County, and my family had to fight Prince George's County so that I could receive the same level of assistive technology I had access to in Virginia. That surprised them. Eventually, at age 16, while in high school, I made the tough decision to leave home because I couldn't take the abuse anymore, and I was taken in by the family of a high school friend. And finally, I could just focus on being a kid. In my senior year of high school, everybody was deciding whether to go to a vocational program or whether to go to college. And I said, for me, there was no choice. I would get into college or die trying. Now listen to this. In this country, more than 50% of blind high school students do not graduate, let alone go on to college and 85% of working age blind adults are unemployed. That is a statistic that has raised 15% over the past 40 years. I was determined to beat these odds. I worked the application process to George Mason University from every angle possible, and they welcomed me in. College was tough. I had to get a job in order to sustain myself while taking college courses. Luckily, I had a seeing eye dog to help me navigate George Mason's large campus. And then eventually, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in communications. Now, despite my turbulent childhood, I look nothing like the difficulties I face from a disability or from abuse or from being destitute. I scored employment with the federal government thankfully because the government had an initiative for people with disabilities. I tried to advance while at that job and I met several people who told me, oh, they told me I would have a sighted, a sighted coworker to help me do this job. You can't do this job without costing the agency a lot of money. Again, there's that diminished expectation. Going to college and getting a federal job was my plan B, and I was living in it. Plan A, ever since I discovered piano playing and singing, was hopefully to do something in Hollywood one day. So now I speak directly to any people with disabilities here today. We have our own responsibility to seize opportunity, training, and be go-getters, so we can always put our best foot forward and always be eager to break down barriers. I believe barriers only exist when one chooses to acknowledge them. 
That's a quote I created three years ago, and I was proud of myself when I came up with that one. Yep. Barriers only exist when one chooses to acknowledge them. So with that said, I'd like to take you to an experience, before I close, take you to an experience where believing in myself and refusing to accept no as an answer led to some success in front of a different expanded audience. 2011 was the year where I auditioned for the second season of Oxygen reality show, The Glee Project. Now, The Glee Project was a competition show in which the winner would win a seven-episode spot on Fox's TV show, Glee, when it was on the air, which was a TV show about a high school music club. Now, The Glee Project had posted that they would be accepting online auditions. And at first, I didn't want to do it. But friends said, what do you have to lose? I submitted an online audition. And then they said, well, they're having auditions in New York as well. And initially, I said, I don't want to go to New York and do that. I already was told no by American Idol, The X Factor, America's Got Talent, all those. I don't want to hear no again. But eventually, I decided that I definitely wanted two bites at the apple. So on November 12th, jumped on a bus to New York with a friend and my sister. The auditions in person in New York started at 10 o'clock, but we were still on the bus at 12 noon. And I'm saying to myself, what's the idea of you guys talking me into wasting my time on this bus? The line's gonna be long when we, got, when we get there. We got there and there were 9,000 people waiting in line. I was discouraged. But eventually we got inside and at each audition room, they were seeing eight people at the same time. You stayed, stood in a line and you would have 20 seconds to sing something that would be memorable and then step back in line and wait for your fate. They said, don't talk, just sing. But Mario Bonds never follows instructions. <laughs> Before I sung, I stepped forward and said, now this was a statement from back then, I was 24. I said, my name is Mario Bonds. I'm 24 years old, but I look 15, which is a prerequisite. And I'm totally blind, despite the fact that I have on good-looking personality glasses. <laughs> and then I sung my audition song and stepped and step back in line. In the end, they said, the rest of you, thank you for coming. Mario, would you please step forward? You're moving on to the next round of auditions. I was stunned that my sister hadn't been picked, but it was time to go do it all again. They took me upstairs to another room where I was told that I would need to do the same thing. I walked in, sung the song, and once I was done, I just stood there and smiled and said, well, if I sounded bad, at least this smile will seal the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and so the producer said, well, thank you for auditioning. So far, 55,000 people have auditioned, and we're narrowing it down until we come up with our top 80 finalists. If we're interested, we'll be in touch. And I thought, yeah, right, this was a great trip, but let's go home. So we jumped back on the bus and went back to Maryland because the next day was Sunday and I had a, a gig at a church. I hate to call it a gig, but it wasn't my church. So it was a gig, it wasn't my church. Yeah, yeah. So as I was putting my keyboard in my friend's car for that gig, my cell phone rang. And I answered it and the voice on the other end said, Hi, Mario, it's Ashley from the Glee Project. Have you left New York yet? And I thought, oh my God, I left my cell phone in New York. And she said, no, you're talking on it. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, the casting director, Robert Ulrich, for Glee is here and wants to see you in person. And disbelief after jumping on and running in the room and, and running around and my yells interspersed with lamps falling over and my friend waking up saying, stop yelling. I said, the casting director wants to see me in person. He said, you can yell. <laughs> so I had to go and do the church gig because you can't put Jesus on hold like that. That's disrespect, <laughs> you know. So I went to do the church gig and after that, we tried to rush to New York and as luck would have it, we ended up stuck on the New Jersey Turnpike. And they said that I needed to be there before six. I called them and told them my plight, and they said, just get here when you can. I didn't get there at six. I got there at 
and was told that Mr. Ulrich had missed a flight because he was waiting for me. And I said to myself, I don't think I'm that much of a good singer. I hope, th I hope this guy isn't that, in <laughs> that disappointed. <laughs> so we arrived at the audition site after running through the streets of Manhattan. And they took me upstairs after telling me that he missed a flight. And I was like, good thing I couldn't see this guy's face. <laughs> I'm out of breath. And immediately he said, OK, what are you singing? Out of breath. I didn't have anything else. So I sung Michael, Bol Michael Bolton's How Am I Supposed to Live Without You after running. How am I supposed to live without you? Luckily, again, I couldn't see his face, so I could just focus on the emotion of the song. Afterwards, he thanked me. I said he'd be in touch if he was interested. And I turned to my friend and said, how much did we spend in gas getting down here? <laughs> so I went back home in disbelief over everything that had happened. But the day before Thanksgiving, I checked my email with the talking software that I use. And an email said, congratulations, Mario. You've been chosen as a part of the top 80 finalists for the Glee Project. It included travel information to Los Angeles and what have you. When I believed it was real, when I believed that it was real, I just started crying. Luckily, the network paid for somebody to accompany me, so the same friend went with me to, La to Los Angeles. And luckily, he did, because when we walked into the hotel where the 80 finalists auditions was going to be, he said, Mara, you won't believe this. And I said, what? Don't tell me I'm going gray already. He said, no. Another blind person had been chosen as a part of the top 80 finalists. And I said, somebody stole my idea. Get that guy out of here. They just wanted to make sure that I can compete with myself. What's the idea another blind person is doing here? That was supposed to be my leg up to Hollywood, who doesn't say yes to a lot of us. So in the auditions, not only did we have to sing and act, we had to be able to dance. And that's not something you associate with a blind person very often. We had a professional choreographer that taught the two blind people the dance, and then he taught the dance to the rest of the potential contestants. And then that same friend said, you know, Mario, he only taught y'all 5% of the dance, you and the other blind guy. I said, what do you mean? He said, he just taught y'all the step forward, step back, raise your hand, smile, step back. But there's a lot of spins and dips and all that stuff, and you could probably do it. So I went and found another show, Hopeful, that I, you know, developed a rapport with and asked him to teach me the whole dance. The guy should have been smart. He shouldn't have taught the dance to me, but he did. And so when it was time to perform the dance for the actual audition, Mario was doing everything that the sighted people were doing at the same time. And Mario looked like he was dancing, not like he was having a standing sophisticated seizure. It blew, it blew the choreographer's mind. He said, I had no idea that you could do that or that a blind person would I couldn't, here's the point of this story. I had proven to him and to them what they thought was impossible was possible. Now sure, at first all of us thought that the Oxygen Network was just trying to show the world in the casting special that they adhere to equal access and inclusion, but that they had no intention of saying yes to a disabled person. Can you sing, Mario? Yes. Can you act? Yes. Can you dance? That was supposed to be a no. And it was now a yes. So with that being said, they cut the 80 down to 40 and then to 30. This blind guy, not the other guy, but this blind guy was still in. After the final audition, they told us that it would be Christmas when they decided who would be on the show. Seven boys and seven girls were being chosen out of 30 possible options. And so the day before Chris Christmas, I received a call from dramatic Robert Ulrich, who said, how you doing, Mario? I said, I'm fine. He said, well, today's been so difficult for me because I've had to tell people a lot of no's more than yes. And I'm calling to tell you that, pause, pause. I'm thinking, this is corny, man. Just tell me it's a no so I can go and get some more chocolate. And he said, and you're a yes. 
So out of 55,000 people, I was chosen as one of the seven boys. Those are huge odds for anyone, without, anyone with sight, no less without it. And I was able to compete on the Glee Project for seven weeks, and the experience it changed my life. And I was able to inspire the world to show them that having a disability doesn't mean that you're not able. I was revered the best dancer on season two of the Glee Project, and I was totally blind. That same spirit of overcoming obstacles is what carried me in my professional endeavors and in Hollywood. The Glee Project confirmed my belief to never underestimate myself. And it reaffirmed my commitment to speak out for disabled people who are so often marginalized. Now, I'd like to leave you with Mario's five golden rules when it comes to people with disabilities. Number one, though we have a disability, we are able individuals. Number two, give us a chance, a chance to show you, a chance to prove to the world we have value. That's all we want. Number three, don't let our disability define us or limit our purpose in this life. Number four, it could just have easily been you or could easily be you with a disability. So always be compassionate without being condescending. And number five, whenever you can, teach people with difficult circumstances or with disabilities what it means to be a conqueror. Conquerors fight to show the world what they're truly made of. Conquerors fight moments of feeling worthless and moments of feeling sorry for ourselves, moments that surely come. I am a conqueror, and so are you. Thank you.